Hello and welcome to Mountain View Church. It's Fellowship Sunday, a day where we celebrate our fellowship of churches, over 500 churches across Canada. Today, you'll hear stories from our churches in the Pacific region. We appreciate you taking the time and we would love the chance to connect with you. If you're new or you haven't reached out before, you can fill out the connect card located under the seat in front of you. You can drop us a note by heading to our website, mountainview.church and clicking connect, or you can text the word connect to the number on your screen. Now, Family Sunday is coming up on April 30th, and one of the things we do on Family Sunday is child dedications. So parents, if you want to dedicate your child or just find out more about what that means, please contact Pastor Jeremy in advance. We are also incredibly thankful for your financial support. To partner with us, you can text the word GIVE to the number on your screen or head over to our website, again, it's mountainview.church, and click GIVE to see our online giving options. And of course, if you're in-house, you'll find an envelope under the seat in front of you. Make sure you put your name and address if you're new so that we can send you a donation receipt. Thank you once again for joining us today. And now it's time for our kids moment. Hey kids, my name is Caitlin and I work downstairs in Base Camp. Base Camp is our kids' church that we have in both our 9.30 and 11 o'clock services. If you cannot join us in-house, don't worry, we have resources online. Just visit us at mountainview.church slash basecamp, where you can find all of our videos and lessons. Campers, this week we are finishing up our series on Jesus. Have you guys ever gone through something difficult in your life? Well, did you guys know that Jesus is there to help you through it? He's been through some hard times too. This week, we are going to learn about how Jesus meets us where we are. He understands our suffering because he suffered too. He listens to us, walks with us through it all, and gives us hope. Isn't it amazing how Jesus can turn bad things into good? Come join us and learn about our amazing Father who is always with us. Hope to see you guys downstairs. Breaks the power of sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless and not in wonder. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Worthy is the king who conquered the grave. 
Valley Church has been starting in the Cowichan Valley here, and it's been really cool to be part of the Fellowship Pacific. It felt crazy, actually, to be boldly going forward. Uh, and we think, like, what is God doing? How is this possible? First of all, is that it's like our hometown. To come back to our hometown and to plant a church just feel, felt like, like, this is so bold. Like, are we just crazy? Um, but as we kind of continued, we just realized that we were crazy, but we were crazy for God and we knew that we needed to go and we would be disobedient if we didn't go. So when we initially came to Duncan, we didn't know how many people we were gonna have. We had like a handful and people were eager to start getting together and just meet and worship together. So we invited people into our home. So we're just gonna start with some communion things and then started more formally. And then after a few weeks, we're like, you know what, we need to open this up. So we just posted on the Facebook page, hey, come to our house and gather, and we're gonna have a little service together, a little gathering together. And we started with maybe 40 people that came. And the next Sunday, there was maybe 50 people that came. And then... We actually had 72 people in our house. And we were like, oh, we have like a little bit of a situation here. We're like, this cannot keep happening in our house. We cannot host 72 people in our home. And so we had planned to come into the theater at the end of November, but we bumped that up. And then the next Sunday, we were here trying to scramble together a service. We had to make space because we couldn't grow further from where we were at. Moving here alone with just our family, it can be very challenging for everybody to have to make new connections and new friendships. And um, even just with the aspect of going into ministry and doing the ministry, it can be actually super lonely. Through this whole experience of planting, we realize that we have connections of all the other um, churches around us who are supporting us. It's been so cool to have the support of Southridge, the support of Gary Firth at a meeting place, uh, Scott Carruthers at Warmland, um, just seeing everything come together. I mean, the meeting place uh, in Nanaimo has been just instrumental because they also meet in the theater. So they actually came and scoped out the theater with us and uh, they, that whole team at that church has been so unbelievably helpful. Our fellowship Pacific has been so supportive and we have people on our advisory team, we have people visiting us from Southridge, um, we have people calling us and texting us um, throughout the week uh, from different fellowship churches. We really still feel supported. We do not feel like an island to ourselves. And so it's been really an awesome story of God uh, here in the Coucher Valley. My grandma would take us here to the Baptist church. I remember being touched by the love of the people that taught Sunday school. And in my teen years, um, I got in, well, I was rebellious. I'd party, stay out all night, not come home. One time I ran away from home and I met up with some guys on the ferry and they took me uh, downtown Vancouver and um, I learned afterwards they were trying to traffic me. I ended up getting away and a Christian family took me in and helped me get home. And I thought, geez, God's really watching out for me. I was having problems with my husband, with trust issues. I was really having intrusive thoughts. So meeting with Julie, I felt as if I had someone to talk to. So in our first 
get together with Cheryl when she was uh, just kept bringing the conversation back to God and talking about the church and stuff, I could tell that there was there was more, that she was really hungry. I, I remember feeling that peace whenever I'd come into her office. She kept bringing up God and talking about God and bringing it back to when she went to Sunday school. And I thought, let her lead. You know, this is obviously God is leading her here. And we talked a lot about God and by the end, uh, I could see that she was just wanting God in her life. She asked me if I if I believe Christ died for us. When I asked her, um, you know, are you ready to ask Jesus into your life? Right away, she said, yes, I am. And I remember um, agreeing with her, yes, I do believe that. It was almost like a relief. I could kind of sense in her that, you know, she didn't know how to ask. She just felt like this is something she needed. And then I, I became a Christian. So it was neat to to see that the seeds planted in the watering and the growth has been building up to that point where she finally made that decision that, yes, I'm going to have God in my life. I'm going to turn my life over to God. This God that she heard about when she went to church with her grandma. So Cheryl was uh, coming to see me for quite a few months. It was more than just counseling, it was discipleship. And she, she began coming to the church and being part of the church, but she wasn't connected to anyone in particular. So I felt like she needed somebody more in her life. And when this leverage pods came up and the opportunity for that, I, I asked her if she would be willing to be part of that. She said, yeah, I would like that. And so I, I wanted somebody older, like an older mother kite figure in her life. And when I was going through all the women in the church, Dot just stood out to me. She said that uh, she had somebody in mind for me who was a, a fairly new Christian. And so I was excited. Julie said, oh, I have someone um, that might be your mentor. Uh, her name's Dot. I, I was so impressed with her because I think the very first time that we got together, we, uh, I prayed for her and she, she prayed. She prayed, so I was so surprised that she would feel comfortable enough to do that. Uh, well, I was uh, keen on getting into the trouble. It was always that barrier where I knew, when I look back, I knew God was actually being the protector. The girls were about a year older than our oldest daughter. So when I would be praying for my own daughter, I'd be praying for her. God was definitely protecting her and keeping her safe. My grandma had uh, people praying over me, even though they didn't know me. You know, I think, I, think, I think the Holy Spirit does a lot of prodding. Like Julie was saying this morning, that she had that feeling that she should pair me up with Cheryl. Now, that wasn't Julie's knowledge of me knowing her because she, she didn't know. It was so amazing uh, to realize that those people were praying for me. Two, two things that I see out of this story, first of all, the power of prayer. Like her grandma uh, bringing her to church and then having the whole prayer group praying for Cheryl for so long and how now that has affected not just Cheryl, but her family, her daughter, her son, her husband, her twin sister and her sister's kids, you know, and the ripple effect that this has. So how important prayer is going forward, you know, for all of us. I'm excited because, you know, it goes around right now. Who's Cheryl going to be 20 years down the road? and. Who's she going to be ministering to in a few years, right? And Cheryl's coming into the family of God has just been incredible. Like she has uh, fit in so well. She's helping with Sunday school, making coffee. She's she's bringing her husband along to do barbecues at a, at the church. He's part of our Bible study now. Her niece and nephew are part of the youth group. It wasn't just like, oh yeah, this is something I'm going to add to my life. This is her life now. I'm excited about uh, future endeavors with God. I also um, see changes in my niece and nephew. I see changes in my husband. And I, I just keep on hoping. And I think as long as we keep on hoping, there's always a future. I am so excited that God has allowed me to be a part of Cheryl's story. And I'm excited to see the future and what's going to happen next.
next. I don't know what the future holds, but I, I know that uh, God will be working in every one of their lives. Hello and welcome to Fellowship Sunday. My name is David Harita and I'm the Regional Director for Fellowship Pacific. This year at our annual gathering, which we call IMPACT, Fellowship Pacific unveiled our new look, our new tagline, and our new online private network in which churches and leaders can share resources, ideas, and engage in discussions. We call this the Commons, and we'd invite you in your church and various leaders to be part of it. All of this is part of our endeavor to gear up for the next big phase of our ministry. In this next phase, we want to focus on peer-to-peer -peer relationships between churches and on retooling to effectively reach the next generation. In this process, as we do it, we're committed to the tagline, Boldly Forward, Never Alone. I understand that when I say those words, when I say boldly forward, that's not a perspective, that's every person's preference. Some of us are much more comfortable with pursuing a more stable journey, which at times certainly can be a very wise choice. Then, of course, there's a the reality that at times boldness can have unintended consequences. When I left my local church after 18 years to move into my role with Fellowship Pacific, as part of the going away festivities, they thought it would be amusing, at least for them, to give me a t-shirt with the words, what's the worst that could happen, written on it. Those were words that some of the people at the church loved. Quite a few had funny stories about failure or dumb things that I did, and some simply cringed when they heard them. Why? Because over the 18 years there, I had the tendency to say those words in all kinds of decision-making scenarios for myself and the church. We would need to make some kind of choice, and I would default to those words. I'd say something like, well, we're never going to know unless we try. Besides, I mean, really? What's the worst that could happen? Those words are sort of the bold version of saying nothing ventured, nothing gained. But let me give you one minor example of how that might actually work. This example is from the home front, which I did communicate to the church at that time in my confession of the week. And yes, my confession of the week was in fact a thing. My wife, Joanna, had been away for a couple of days and I decided it would be a great idea to vacuum before she returned. And let's be honest, it was a good idea. Due to the potato crumbs, potato chip crumbs on the floor in front of the TV. And as a bonus, if I vacuumed, it would make me feel like I should win husband of the year. It was a feeling that I liked the idea of. I didn't get it very often. Unfortunately, while vacuuming the heavy pile on the living room rug, the vacuum continually overheated and turned itself off. It was, as many of you can imagine, super irritating. There is nothing worse than sacrificing 10 minutes away from a Toronto Blue Jays baseball game so that you can impress your wife with how good a Christian you are and the tools don't work. So in the interest of more efficient work and making it easier for Joanna in the future, strictly with her in mind, I took an electrical wire and I just bypassed the reset button that cut off the motor when it overheated. Some of you are wondering, and yes, I did think about it, briefly, sure, but I thought about it, and I thought, what's the worst that could happen? So here's a free learning moment for all of you on Fellowship Sunday. It turns out that when you bypass the reset button on your vacuum, the worst that can happen is that the vacuum head blossoms into flames and you have to run around finding a way to put it out before your rug catches on fire. Although, in retrospect, that's not really the worst that can happen. The actual worst that can happen is when your wife comes home, sees what you did, rolls her eyes, and then tells you that the vacuum head has a very secret, carefully hidden setting that you can move up and down for different heights of carpet. In case this should ever happen to you, I need to tell you that it is quite hard to rapidly dissipate the smell of an electrical fire in your living room. 
And also in case it's lost on you, I do confess, this is my confession of the week in this Fellowship Sunday video, that I didn't use the vacuum all that often or maybe I would have known that. So why this phrase? Why boldly forward, never alone, especially if we're to add after it, after all, what's the worst that could happen? Well, the first reason for this tagline for our fellowship future is really because you asked for it. Some of you may be able to fire up the way back machine and remember that in 2016, we agreed on a new collaborative model of ministry that we called at the time Partnership 2016. With all that has happened since that time, now I guess seven years ago, it feels like it was a lifetime ago. But at the heart of it was a belief that we, that is as churches, agencies, together, were operating in too many silos and that our churches wanted a more collaborative model. And so we attempted to step boldly into that future. So last year, when we did an extensive survey of our churches, we felt pretty good. Because out of a long list of possible words, I think it was somewhere between 40 and 60 words, more than half of you identified these three words as the most descriptive words for Fellowship Pacific. Number one was mission-minded, number two was partnering, number three was supportive, and the word collaborative followed immediately behind. And that's awesome. But you also told us that you wanted us to move boldly forward with the three highest descriptors of our desired future being visionary, diverse, and still mission-minded. Also within the top 10 were the words collaborative, innovative, and risk-taking. Somewhat shockingly, the descriptive word with the lowest score was the word traditional. In fact, only 1% of you were looking for that in the future of Fellowship Pacific. So if you listen to all of those words, you can hear them resonating with the phrase, boldly forward, never alone. And we've heard you. The regional board and the staff have discussed these ideas at length, and we are seeking to pursue both avenues, making it and taking our mission, our vision and values and new tagline seriously. It might be helpful to remember that our fellowship vision statement passed at impact a couple of years ago is to innovatively develop relationships and resources that will propel every fellowship church to be accountable to their shared gospel mandate. Innovation, relationships, resources, accountability. All of those in the interest of the gospel. The second reason for adopting this phrase as a tagline, and obviously the more important reason, is because we believe it captures the heart of Christ's call for us as churches as discovered in the New Testament. So come with me on a brief survey of two passages of Scripture. One of the most famous, I think, and foundational passages for Christ followers and churches is usually referred to the Great Commission. It's one of those things we tend to memorize early in our Christian life along with John 3.16. And that's because it is truly great in every way. The Great Commission empowers us, it commands us, and it will take our entire life to grow into, and not even then will we fully achieve it. The Great Commission passage is found in Matthew 28, 18 to 19, and it occurs right after the resurrection of Jesus. He's just come out of the tomb, and he's passed on a message to the women who met him outside the tomb, and he arranged a meeting with the disciples who were not there at that time, for later on, on a mountain in Galilee. The Bible tells us that when they got together and they saw the resurrected Jesus, the disciples worshipped him, but some doubted. And he challenged them and sends them out into the world with these words, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you to the very end of the age. We call it the Great Commission 
because it is a very clear commissioning for every person and every church to go to every nation and every ethnic group proclaiming the name of Jesus. It is in no way timid. So notice a few things in this passage. First, it's a command based on the fact that Jesus has all authority. God the Father has given him that authority, we're told, on heaven and on earth. It's not a negotiable kind of a statement. Second, it's a command to every one of us, to me and to you, to go and make disciples, not just converts, but actual growing and committed followers of Jesus. The imperative is to make disciples, and it's accompanied by three participles, making it clear that we all have the responsibility to go, to baptize, and to teach. Third, notice that the authority of Jesus imbues this command with his power, the power given to him by the Father. And Jesus promises to never leave us alone. He says that he will be with us until the end of the age. In that sense, the words never alone mean that when we move boldly forward in faith following Jesus, Jesus comes alongside us and empowers us. The repeated and extremely bold word in this passage is the word all. It's a word that gets a little bit lost in the New International Version, if that's the version of the Bible you're using, but it's a word actually used four times, the same word used four times, saying, all authority is given. Go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all things, and I will be with you all days. It's not a command for hesitant believers, and it is a command that would become the call of the church in the first generation and in every generation since. In short, it's a call to boldly move forward, always with him, always alongside of him. Another biblical account that's worthy of note is at the beginning of Acts. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, immediately prior to his ascension to heaven, Jesus carries forward the idea of the Great Commission, given at the end of Matthew, and sets the theme for the fledgling New Testament church. That the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they would be his witnesses. It's a promise and a command, in a sense, in a way that continued to move boldly outward to Jerusalem, to Judea, to Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. By the second chapter of Acts, on the day of Pentecost, we're told that bewildering things were happening in this church. It felt like a huge outdoor storm happened, but it was within the home where they were gathering and both wind and fire was present, and it was a clear indicator of the presence of the promised Holy Spirit. We're told that the Holy Spirit came on people, and they spoke in a variety of languages, declaring the wonders of God. Particularly noticeable was the fact that the fire representing the Holy Spirit separated and rested on individual people, a sign that the Spirit was now being given widely to everybody, individually, and not just to corporate Israel. This was the new church. And the Apostle Peter picks up on this in his amazing sermon recorded later in the same chapter. He quotes the prophet Joel, stating that in the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. Peter goes on later in the same sermon, starts to talk about Jesus and he pronounces that this man Jesus was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and God's deliberate foreknowledge and that you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. As I'm recording this, it, was, it is one day before Easter weekend, so Good Friday's tomorrow. And I think of the words of this early sermon of Peter, just as the new church was being inaugurated. This is our battle cry. 
This is the hinge point of Christian history. This is the moment in which everything changes because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. Why would we not be bold? I love the way this chapter ends. It goes immediately from Peter's sermon and all the power of that, ending with a statement that 3,000 people were added to the church that day. But does, then it does an abrupt switch into the kind of relationships and the fellowship and the connectedness that characterized this early church. And the writer of Acts describes it this way at the end of chapter 2. He says, All the believers were together, and they had everything in common. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily who, those who were being saved. This is a story that can never become commonplace for us. It brings together the power and the work of God through the Spirit of God, along with the fundamental fact of the crucifixion and the resurrection, with the dual outcomes of a growing church and legitimate sacrificial community where they cared for one another and they worked together for the sake of the kingdom. It was on the basis of the work of the Spirit and the central reality of the resurrection of Jesus that authentic and vulnerable community grew. These were not two separate things. They came together, boldly forward, never alone. It's the story we all want for our own churches and our own lives. It's the story of the early church. And it needs to be the exciting reality for every one of our churches and for the people in our churches. Boldly Forward is the story of Northwest Baptist Seminary, which heard the desire of our churches for a new undergrad program and has reimagined it within our competency-based theological education paradigm. It allows for a student who so desires to be able to move into a variety of ministry forums throughout the program year by year, including things like big or small churches, camps, urban settings, rural settings, agencies, all the while getting an undergrad degree. It includes all of us, and it demands a never-alone perspective. Boldly Forward is the story of Village Church, the story of Valley Church, of Harbor Church, of a Korean online church, and of a relational ministry that's beginning as a church in Ahusset. Village Church, which most of you know, is our largest church, is rethinking some of its basic assumptions about how to do satellite ministry in Canada. It's kind of amazing that they're doing that. Because while by all standards they have been successful and are successful, they realize that the need for a bold movement forward for the gospel never ends. And so if we need to change, we do. On the other end of the spectrum, Valley Church is a brand new church plant in Duncan where Wes and Christy Lindy risked leaving an established ministry where he had been for a long time, and they answered the call of God to return to the town they grew up in, with a lot of support from Camp Kiwanos and Southridge Fellowship, both boldly forward and never alone. In a totally different way, Harbor Church, another new church, is stepping into the unknown to begin a micro-church network in Nanaimo experimenting on how to reach and disciple people with a new paradigm. Something we haven't really done before, but have thought about quite a bit. With another unique and a different dream yet again, Joshua Lee, who is currently serving in one of our churches, has started a separate online church gathering Koreans dispersed throughout our regions who have nowhere to fellowship, nowhere to connect. And after six years of relationship building, six years of it, one of our Korean leader couples, Jacob and Rachel Huan, are now beginning to start a church and looking for the formation of a church in the First Nations community of Ahusset, which is on an island, which is a 50-minute boat trip from Tofino off the west coast of Vancouver Island. Whether big or small, in a wide divergence of church models, each of these churches and leaders, and many more I have not mentioned, are stepping boldly forward. And none of them can do it alone. 
and none of them should ever be alone. When we live out the Great Commission in the power of the Spirit, joining together in common, God works. And as in Acts 2 in the story of the early church, I absolutely believe that God, the Lord, still adds to their number daily those who are being saved. Boldly forward, never alone, transcends any one of us. It's Fellowship Pacific deciding to add $25,000 per year to our budget in order to build our private fellowship online community, the Commons, which I already mentioned. We looked at the high value and the need for community across the geographic expanse of our region. We looked at the fractures that were caused by COVID and the need for healing. We looked at our belief that the future denominationalism is found in peer-to-peer -peer relationships between churches. And we looked at the fact that the next generation already lives and breathes the oxygen of technology. And we realized we had no choice. If our leaders and our volunteers are to be never alone while literally thousands of miles apart from one another, then something different had to be tried. Additionally, Boldly Forward has meant reforming our internal staff structures yet again. We seem to do that a lot. This time to begin an internal team who are aimed at addressing the critical and the pressing needs of the next generation. It is not enough for us or for any of our churches to simply throw up our hands at the 66 or so percent that leave the church after high school and say this next generation just needs to think like we do. That would fix everything. It doesn't. While the gospel is always relevant and the Bible is always authoritative, we need to be brave enough to see where the church has become irrelevant to this next generation's needs and dreams. How do we help them again to see the meaningfulness that exists in Christ for our world? I don't have time to regale you with the stories of our camps, including the first year of a new wilderness camp in the Kootenays, which is very exciting. I'd love to tell you about the boldly growing ministry of WINGS, helping women in desperate need and just starting to really take off in many possible directions. Or talk about Baptist housing, helping seniors, or any of the others of our partnering agencies other than for you to know God's working. But look, bottom line is this is a simple message with a simple theme. It feels like I've been in my role as Regional Director here at Fellowship Pacific for a long time. And it's likely that in all of that time I have never been renowned for holding strongly to the status quo. Okay, more honestly, it's even more likely I haven't been renowned for anything at all. Nevertheless, in these years together, it's felt like one change after another. We began a long time ago with a need to completely revamp our structures, our finances and mission. We had a report that said we have one opportunity to do this well. And we started down that road. And year after year, the need for change has never ended. In that process, we have tried to consistently apply an unchanging message to a changing culture and to the changing needs in our churches. We've attempted a lot of things. And in the process, and because I'm a slow learner, I've been known to say many times in all kinds of scenarios, we should try it. What's the worst that could happen? Unfortunately, I've learned quite a few answers to that question because not everything works. In fact, if you want to know how to make ministry mistakes in the interest of getting better at what we do, we would be the ones to ask. We're the experts and I'm the most expert of them all in making mistakes. Because that's true, I go back to the early church stories a lot. I go back to the accounts of the apostles and the teachers of the early church, and I realize over and over again that everything they did didn't always work the way they imagined either, although it did work the way God wanted it to. But I can envision Paul or Peter talking to the church gatherings about some big change or something different and saying, I don't know, we should try. What's the worst that could happen? And sometimes I imagine God the Father listening in on those conversations, covering his eyes and saying, I don't think I want to watch this. 
Yeah, I know, bad theology, don't send me an email. Going with grace here. Often I believe God has already pegged me for the job of court jester in heaven. But these early church leaders were undeterred because they knew the stakes. They knew the importance of the gospel of Jesus. And so do we. And so we are undeterred as well. Jesus remains the hope of a broken world, and the church remains the missional agency to deliver that message of hope so that we will continue to move boldly forward together to make a God-honoring impact in our region and beyond. And as always, it's our hope and our prayer that in that journey, none of us would go alone. My friends, this should be the song of the church. It should be our song and we should be singing it passionately together. Sold out to the gospel, knowing that our risen Savior wins, knowing that it was impossible for death to hold him, and that knowing that while we wait for his victorious return, we are in this together. We aren't walking alone. Boldly forward. Never alone.